My name is Arthur Tune and I'm a Louis Dreyfus scholar and I um, would like to say thank you so much for the opportunity to study the MBA that I studied in 2016 here at Oxford. So we're going to get straight into the panels that we have. Thank you for the opportunity to share as well as the opportunity to meet some old friends, really old friends, some new friends and hopefully some future friends. So what we're going to do is that we've got three panels today. And the three panels that we have will then extend, and then after that we'll have breakout rooms where we'll have discussions that are very region specific. So the general structure of what we're doing is everyone has about, each panelist has about four minutes to speak. And then at the end of the panel, we're going to have about six minutes of question and answer segment. So the panelists will be engaging with the audience. Now, for those of us who will have those burning questions that we cannot just keep in, please use our chat box and also discuss the questions that you put in the chat box. Uh, but again, this is just the start of the conversation. The conversation goes on as we go into the rooms. So our first panel is titled uh, Big Meet Small. How can central banks, governments and NGOs support small scale farmers and communities? And the first panelist we're going to have is Antonio. Antonio works uh, with the Delivery Associates in Mexico, where he supports the governments in Latin America to improve policy implementation methods whilst building capacity. For the past year, he has been working with the COCA Competitiveness Improvement Plan, which aims to improve agricultural results for small-scale farmers. 70% of these farmers are below the poverty line. Now, the context, Antonio, is that we expect that governments are the ones that will lead the charge when it comes to implementing change. But we're seeing that governments are struggling with this. And this is not just with the new issues around technology, but also some old issues. The question for you, Antonio, is what have you observed to be the biggest challenge in the way of governments to meeting the needs of small farmers? Uh, over to you, Antonio. Thank you for the scholarship. It has been an amazing year in Oxford. Well, I'll just jump into, into the point. Um, the two learnings I'll share in the following minutes are based on the experience of working with Latin American countries, right? I'll always start with the conceptual side of the story and then talk about a specific example. So the guiding question, how can governments help small farmers? Let me take a step back to answer that question because my first learning is that we need to help governments to prioritize for them to be effective. Let me illustrate my case. Today, Latin American governments are under huge financial stress. The public agenda of Latin American governments combines challenges of the past, which are still unresolved, new emerging challenges. COVID-19 is a great example. It has compounded rural development problems that were quite pressing way before the pandemic hit. So in light of such ever expanding set of important issues, Latin American governments try to embrace everything at the same time with the limited resources they have. The result is an overwhelmed public service and, and limited progress at the end of the day. I like to call this a, a state of hyperactive paralysis where everyone is working really hard, but little gets done because efforts are too fragmented. So my first learning is that we need to help governments to prioritize first. In other words, make them make tough decisions early on and keep the focus on a few essential numbers to move. Let me go to an example now. In a specific country I worked, the government had a really ambitious and well-designed plan to tackle food security and poverty in small farmers in line with the SDGs. But um, the plan consisted of 28 very complex policy interventions. For instance, one of the 28 was generating a traceability system to certify deforestation free crops, a technology that takes years maybe and thousands of dollars to develop. Now imagine 28 of this in different policy areas. In my view, available resources were not sufficient to tackle them all. It took several workshops with relevant stakeholders of the government to finally narrow down those 28 to three in the medium term, and then to one in the short term. So first learning is that help the government to prioritize of food security and helping small farmers will remain empty promises. Which brings me to the next point. Again, I'll start with a concept and then extrapolate that to an example. That the government decides what to prioritize is not enough. Governments do not often fail in understanding what they need to do. Governments mostly fail when deciding how to do whatever policy they have decided. This is because Latin American governments invest 90% of the effort and time in policy design and only 10% in implementation when this should be the other way around. 
My second learning is precisely this, in understanding how to translate ideas into concrete work. And that is where implementation capacity comes into play. Let me illustrate this with an example now in, in, in a Latin American country. The government redesigned the loan scheme for small farmers to avoid misuse of the loan. The National Bank had made internal research and found out that the default rate of small farmers was caused mainly by misuse of the loan. For instance, farmer A would go to the bank, get approval for a loan to, to improve the productivity of, of his or her crop, then receive the funds and, and get tempted to use it for personal purposes rather than for investing in productivity. And this would later on end up in a default. So the government would add a choice architecture element. What is this? The default choice for the redesigned loan was a scheme in which automatic transfer would be made to input providers, fertilizers, certified seeds, good quality plants, etc., unless the farmer stated otherwise. The idea was very clear. If the farmer wanted to receive the funds fully, the farmer needed to go to the bank and actively state that. Otherwise, automatic transfer would be activated. So what was not very clear was the how, the definition of success. What is the aspiration, the key performance indicator, the target, why? What does the trajectory look like towards that target? What is our best estimation of progress month by month? How does the delivery chain look like? from the final beneficiary, the farmer, up to the minister who makes the calls, what happens in the middle? Who is involved? Does everyone in the chain have a common understanding of it? Are there risks that need to be mitigated? It was very standard procedure in Latin America, in this Latin American country, that none of these questions was addressed um, beforehand by the bank or the agriculture ministry. Everybody in the chain had a different understanding of how the delivery of loans would occur what the target would be, what the risks were. So my second learning is that big institutions need to invest more in implementation capacity of government officials. Offering governments a beautiful policy is simply not enough. Telling governments, hey, this works very well, is not enough. To, we have to help them with implementation capacity tailored to their own reality. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lian, who is a research economist who works for the government central bank in Hong Kong. Her, her work focuses on economic shocks, such as COVID, policy changes, structural shifts, including technology evolution, supply chain reconfiguration, climate change and urbanization, and how these affect economic development and livelihoods in the Asian region. Now, Lian, small scale farmers are still affected by the micro macroeconomic trends and policies, regardless of whether their instances are considered during the design phase. What role can central banks play in the security and the development of farming communities? Uh, thank you, Atherton, and I also want to say thank you so much to the Louis Dreyfus Foundation for their generous scholarship. Uh, I completed my MPhil in economics in 2017 and have been working with, uh, with the central bank in Hong Kong ever since. And so diving straight into the question, um, I first want to uh, quickly describe the role of a central bank in an economy and make the connection with small farmers, which at first glance may not be so clear. So um, monetary policy refers to the actions that central banks take to um, promote stable growth in the economy. This usually takes a form of maintaining price stability through influencing borrowing costs and the scale of borrowing and lending in the economy. So wh why and how is monetary policy relevant to small farmers? Well, first of all, um, stable and predictable prices is crucial to small farmers who have less ability to absorb price changes and whose income largely depends on relatively volatile commodity and food prices. Even short periods of highly volatile food prices, as we saw in 2011, for example, could uh, force productive assets to be sold at lower prices and result in small farmers falling into poverty. Unpredictable inflation may also discourage small farmers from longer term investments into boosting their productivity and to expanding and through influencing interest rates and lending in the economy, which will filter through the financial system, monetary policy can also affect the lending of smaller credit institutions and private organizations that small farmers typically interact with. 
Uh, that being said, there often may be a disconnect between small farmers and central bank policy because a lot of the time they fall outside of the formal banking system. This is because they lack a formal credit profile or sufficient collateral and therefore face significantly higher costs and uh, greater barriers in obtaining financing even when aggregate financial conditions are highly accommodative. So in the current context of COVID, for example, Many central banks in the Asia region have pursued aggressive interest rate cuts and provided emergency liquidity facilities. Um, but there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that smaller and higher risk entities, including small farmers, still struggle to obtain financing. So what levers can central banks specifically pull to make positive change in this area? And if we can move to the next slide, thank you. Um, so central banks can play an important role in promoting financial inclusion among small farmers. In fact, in several countries, central banks may offer direct or indirect forms of targeted lending to the agricultural sector, albeit usually acting on behalf of the fiscal authorities. For example, um, the Agricultural Development Bank of China is a government policy bank with the goal of targeting lending and supporting the development of rural agriculture and small farmers. And for them, uh, a big portion of their operating funds comes directly from the central bank, the People's Bank of China. However, in order to establish a commercially viable, market-oriented and sustainable form of financing to these communities, requires the collaborative efforts of central banks, governments, and private actors. Where central banks can play an important role is to facilitate the establishment of an efficient risk compensation mechanism for small farmer financing. For example, central banks are well positioned to provide a centralized platform for regular exchange of information between uh, financial institutions, small farmers, and organizations such as the Louis Dreyfus Foundation, which work directly with small farmers, so that banks can gain further insight into the risk, unique risk dynamics of small farmer financing. Uh, in addition, central banks can also provide an accommodative monetary environment or a regulatory environment for new technology-based fintech firms, which have shown the ability to access underserved communities such as small farmers by providing innovative and alternative ways of credit assessment and lending. Uh, an, example for, uh, an example is simple cell phone based payment systems such as M-Pesa in Kenya, as well as WeChat and Alipay in mainland China, which allow small farmers to build a digital credit profile using transactional data. This can ultimately help banks to fairly and efficiently price and provide a wide range of financial instruments to small farmers to allow them to build their wealth, save in uh, financial assets, to hedge against uncertainties, um, and, uh, and invest in productive assets and skills, which will ultimately feed back into economic growth and ties into central banks' macroeconomic objectives. Thank you so much. But the next speaker that we have today is Tanvi. Tanvi is a researcher at the Water, Land and Society Program of the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. This is a non-profit think tank in Bangalore. Previously, she worked with the Climate Unit of the UN World Food Program on the rollout of organizational environmental sustainability policy and design grassroots level climate adapt adaptation programs. So Tanvi, in addition to central governments, central banks, and the supranational institutions they form, including political unions, multilateral development banks, NGOs have, be have become important development actors. The question is, as NGOs are often equal partners with governmental and financial institutions in the field of development, and they, and they also have visibility in small communities, how can NGOs improve on their core missions? Over to you. Well, I was a Louis Dreyfus uh, scholar in 2016-17 when I did a master's in environmental change and management in Oxford. And as Atherton mentioned, I will be speaking from the NGO perspective today. So in my understanding, NGOs create crucial linkages between communities and governments, banks, and philanthropies, and they're often directly involved in designing and implementing projects. So my observation has been that the problems faced by small farmers are often received by large centralized organizations in a sort of templatized manner 
which can oversimplify their situations and represent them in ways that are kind of disconnected from the ground reality. This problem is often reflected in project design efforts. Uh, so within the agriculture development sector, there are several ideas which have been mainstreamed as sort of overarching universal concepts. And um, some of these are on the screen, like for example, efficiency is a desirable aim. Resilience is often portrayed as the ultimate objective and nature-based solutions are portrayed as natural and hence ideal. And these end goals also often come with technologies that are regarded as silver bullets. So technologies like drip irrigation, clean cook stuff, sustainable intensification practices are often regarded as technologies which can be put into a context and expected to work. However, obviously these universal concepts are not always in line with contextual realities. So for example, I conducted a research project in central India where there was a large program to promote crop diversity as a means to increase the adaptive capacity of local farmers. The premise of this project was another universal concept, which was that um, conserving crop diversity can help achieve several local aims while also helping to reduce the rate of uh, crop diversity erosion at the global level. While this may be true in several contexts, my observation in the study area was that farmers were in fact reluctant to continue to adopt diversity-based risk mitigation because their preferences revolved around cultivating more aspirational mainstream crops and arranging for irrigation rather than resorting to diversification as a means to cope with the climate variability that they were facing. So this sort of lack of grounding that surrounds design interventions is also often accompanied by the absence of critical evaluation of project outcomes. So in the example that I just shared, a monitoring and evaluation report would probably measure performance on indicators like the number of seed packets of crops that have been distributed to farmers or the number of workshops that have been conducted for farmers. But these indicators don't really question the theory of change that underpins the project. And so they're not really able to capture whether the project will create long-term positive change in the community. Um, so yeah, these kind of projects which are based on a lack of contextual planning and do not have critical evaluation are obviously counterproductive to very well-intentioned development efforts in the agriculture sector. A lot of money and effort goes into designing and implementing projects, but they often also fail to continue after the funding period is over, and in several cases can exacerbate issues of the, that the farmers face rather than resolving them. So coming to what levers institutions can pull to make positive change, NGOs are often caught in the cycle of having to tailor projects to fit in with funding priorities, which are based on restricted universal and decontextualized concepts. In addition, funding also usually depends on portraying positive narratives of change rather than allowing for critical and honest evaluation of the limitations that projects may have. There are some emerging solutions in the way of projects being designed in a more participatory, participatory manner, However, there is still a glaring lack of two-way communication between NGOs and funders. There is also a very clear power dynamic in the system whereby NGOs feel reluctant and un unable to kind of share the real realities of the ground with funders in the fear of losing out on crucial financing. So more open lines of communication, possibly through anonymous feedback processes, would help tailor funding requirements to better suit uh, sorry, tailor funding strategies and structures to better suit ground requirements. Additionally, the problem of inaccurate monitoring and evaluation can be tackled by amending funding infrastructure to create a system that encourages celebrating and learning from failures rather than just brushing them under the carpet. So bringing in an element of risk capital can create a buffer within the funding for initial mistakes and adjustments uh, to ensure that these become naturalized into the process rather than things that need to be hidden and not discussed at all. Uh, lastly, long-term funding rather than short projects can help ensure that there is sufficient time within the project to tweak the project, implement it properly, and allow it to get mainstreamed in the form of behavioral and systemic change in target communities. So the first question that we have, Tanvi, goes to you, which is, what are the downsides of using nature-based solutions as a universal concept in your work? Um, I am from the NBS support camp, so I am interested to know why you think this is problematic. So I don't think nature-based solutions are a problem per se. I think the fact that they have been mainstreamed into the development discourses 
uh, the development discourse as this sort of um, black box solution, which consists of templatized approaches to kind of, uh, which fit into the solution are what the problem is. So instead of critically thinking about what constitutes a nature-based solution, uh, in a lot of regions there are, for example, mangrove afforestation projects, which are just implemented and marketed under the ambit of a nature-based solution without thinking about whether or not this, the, the intervention fits into the area, how the community perceives the intervention, whether it works in terms of ecology and society uh, and you know, various contexts textual needs is the problem with the nature-based solution rhetoric, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Uh, Antonio, there's a question uh, here. The question is, does the active choice framing for financial support disadvantage those who might not be aware of programs or how to get the support? Great question. And, and that was mainly the, the second point of my exposition. I think if we, if we when, when we implement this, this new loan scheme, if we don't have the delivery chain very clear, where the final beneficiary is, is getting the policy rightly and timely, then the policy at all is not useful. So it is really important that we have that delivery chain upfront, transparently, with all stakeholders involved in the, in the delivery processes of, of the loan scheme. So that's an indirect way of answering to your question. Leanne, a question for you is, in India, we have seen philanthropic funders and social investors step in to provide the primary capital and risk guarantees for microloans for the informal sector, outside of the ambit of the government. Is that something that the government and the central bank is allowed in geographies like Hong Kong for smallholder farmers? Thank you, Aditi, for your question. Uh, apologies not uh, for me not raising a lot of examples through Hong Kong, because actually in Hong Kong, the uh, agricultural sector is very small, represents, I think, something less than 1% of our GDP. Most of our agricultural imports come from mainland China, so I'll talk a bit more from that view. Um, to my understanding, I think the majority of funding uh, in mainland China for small rural farmers still comes from rural credit cooperatives, which are run uh, under the government, as well as um, more larger policy institutions, such as the Agricultural Development Bank of China, which is under the PBOC. And so I think there, there is increasingly, we're seeing more um, private funders or social investors in mainland, but I think majority is still run under the government and um, yeah, under the, the gambit of uh, the rural credit cooperatives. Uh, Tanvi, a question for you. What about the role of baseline to ensure adequate solutions to be implemented? And then for uh, people that are not in the field, what are nature-based solutions? Just quickly on the nature-based solutions question, uh, they are essentially, in my understanding, a very broad uh, gamut of ideas which are around ecosystem restoration, afforestation, and just uh, a less technocratic, technology-oriented um, view of um, environmental restoration efforts, but more around ecosystem-based methods. Uh, and thank you, Robert, for your question. I, I didn't mention baselines, and I do agree that baselines have a very crucial role to ensure that uh, there is a very uh, real understanding of the ground situation before implementing a project. Having said that, I also feel that even within baselines, it is important to have a very broad perspective of the situation that we're starting with, rather than just being restricted to very narrow indicators, which a lot of baseline uh, studies sadly remain restricted to doing. So yes, baselines can, in my opinion, be very, are very important, uh, but should not just be a box ticking exercise. 